Hey, this is Johnny Jett. Welcome back to my 39 Travel Questions YouTube channel and podcast. Please subscribe to both if you haven't. And today we have Mark Walters of Walters World, who travels the world and is also a professor in Illinois. Is that public information, by the way? Yeah, that's public information. Okay. They can find me. They can find all the information they want out about me. Okay. I was like, <laughs> otherwise we can re-record this. But uh, Mark, thank you for joining me today and no uh, welcome to the show. So first of all, how can people find you? So you can find me. We like to be consistent. So you can find us at waltersworld.com. You can find us on YouTube slash waltersworld. Twitter, Twitter, you know, at waltersworld. Instagram at waltersworld. Facebook.com slash waltersworld. If you like Pinterest, you have Pinterest, you know, dot com slash waltersworld. I think you can find us on LinkedIn somewhere. So we, we've, uh, we've got them all kind of covered with Walter's World. Uh, so those are the best places to find us out. If you have any questions about travel, feel free to shoot us an email or whatever or, or a social media comment. We'll do what we can to get back to help you out. Good. And I'm going to make a blog post out of this. So to find all of his links. So please subscribe to johnnyjet.com's newsletter. Now, done with the plug. So Mark, where'd you grow yes. up? So I grew up in Quincy, Illinois, a small town in the western part of Illinois. And where do you live now? I live in Champaign, Illinois, the home of the University of Illinois. And that's where you work. That's where I work. I'm actually an alumnus from the University of Illinois as well. So, you know, it's like if you ever can find a job later in life, go back to your alumnus, your alumni, you know, your <laughs> university. Maybe they can help you out. And what do you teach and what was your major? So my major was marketing. And I actually now am teaching the marketing courses that I took uh, a couple decades ago. <laughs> And how are you doing with the quarantine? Have you traveled and will you travel tomorrow if, if you, do you feel comfortable enough to travel tomorrow? Well, I, th I think it's interesting because when the quarantine first came out, we, you know, we, all of our stuff, everybody's stuff got canceled March, April, May, and, and we had hoped that we could travel later this summer because um, we had, I mean, we've had probably eight trips already canceled. And so we were hoping for later in the summer, but now with the new spikes going on, that's all out the door. Um, our trips for the fall have also been canceled. I got an email last night or we have one for Ireland in the fall that got, that got Zonko. So we have one like official international trip left, but I'm sure that one would get canceled probably eventually as well. So right now we're looking for mostly if, if you're going to travel, it'd be mostly domestic travel. We did go down to Georgia um, early July. Did you fly? There. Uh, no, we drove down. Uh, we'll probably end up doing mostly road trips this summer. So would you get on a plane tomorrow? Yeah, I would. Uh, you know, I mean, as long as you're using the protective gear and everyone else is wearing the protective gear, I mean, the, the masks make a difference. I mean, I have mask here for work. I got no more masks over there. Um, <laughs> all kinds of variations of masks uh, for travel. I mean, but the thing is, is people need to realize if you don't feel comfortable with it, it's okay not to travel. And so that's my whole thing is like, look, if you don't feel, it's, it's like anytime you travel, if you don't feel comfortable going to a place or you're something that doesn't, you know, don't feel bad about saying, you know what? Now's not the time. So right. for a long time, we were saying, you know, don't travel, don't travel. And right now there's certain places you probably shouldn't travel to. Um, but I'm, I'm willing to travel again. And, and by the way, are you, are you, uh, your classrooms, are they meeting in person or are they virtual? So last week, I just found out that all of my classes will be online in the fall. Uh, but the University of Illinois where I teach is, they're going to have like a hybrid. So there's going to be some classes will be like, some students you'll come like one day and other students come another day and then some of the stuff will be online. But I teach really large classes. And so like one of my classrooms has 320 students, but there's 325 seats. So they just put all that online. So I have three large classes online for the well, fall. So as a travel influencer or YouTuber, vlogger, how, how do you describe yourself, by the way? Uh, Content creator. Traveler. Okay. Uh, I like that. Uh, um, a, a happy person, a positive person who likes to share the world with people. But isn't that almost like a dream come true for you? Because you could be working anywhere. You could be anywhere in the world and doing your class. Yeah, no, I mean, that, that's one of the things that's with, with all the quarantines, you know, we, my wife and I actually discussed maybe we could, cause you know, I, I, I did my PhD in Portugal. So I lived there for five years. Our, our youngest son was born in Portugal. So we thought, oh, this could be a chance for us to go back to Portugal, spend a few months there. So I could just teach online from there. But with the restrictions, that's, that's not possible now. So, we're trying to figure, you know, it's like, oh, you could have a pseudo sabbatical, like you'd be teaching online, but right. you could go someplace. But unfortunately, with how things are, we're pretty much, it's going to be domestic only. So I bet we'll end up taking our kids around to show them more of the U.S. So maybe like do the, the Rockies, the upper Midwest and stuff like that. And so. your kids are nine and 13, you said. Yes. And so they travel with you how much of the time? I would say they're 70 to 80% of the time they go with us. 
Um, cause I'm, I'm very big into like taking your kids with you, taking them to travel. Cause I hear all these people talk all the time. Like, Oh, I mean, I, literally you'll see people like have kids like might as well throw away my passport. Might as well burn my passport. I'm like, why take your kids with you? And, and I'm like, and then people will say, Oh, well, they don't remember. It doesn't matter. If they don't remember. You remember, you have these great memories of your kids. I mean, I, my, my youngest, I still remember him taking his first steps by himself in Paris. And I'm like, Oh, there it is. You know, he's in the gardens and he's walking around like, this is such a great experience. Of course he doesn't remember, but I do. I mean, look, I still have goose. I'm getting goosebumps remembering it, you know? And, and so over the years, we've really tried to help people feel more comfortable with traveling because because my whole thing is like, we're not travel agents, we're not travel, you know, coordinators, whatever, we're just trying to facilitate people like give you the skills so you can travel on your own. It's like your website, your website is great for people to help people, you know, figure out what do I need to know from the basics to the more advanced to what credit cards to pick. You have all that stuff that helps people do it on their own. I mean, you're not a travel agent, Johnny, but no. you help people so much they can be their own kind of travel guide. And, and that's the same thing we try to do. We just try to like give people exactly. that kind of the, the, the skills. And so yeah. I think that's one of the things that comes from my teaching. I'm like, look, it's not my job to do the exam for my students. It's my job to get my students ready for that exam. Just like it's my job to help my, the, the people that watch our travel videos to prepare them for that adventure in Portugal or that adventure in Japan or Rwanda or wherever they're going to go. Right. I, I agree with you with the kids 100%. When my wife and I had our first child three years ago, almost four years ago, we were like, oh my congratulations. God. Congratulations. Thank you. And we just had another one 10 months ago, 11 oh, months ago today. You Thank look you. so awake. <laughs> <laughs> like, how you look so I remember my kids, but I'm like, I, the bags are even like deeper. And <laughs> oh man, it is rough. My wife's amazing. But, you know, my son, he only flew, he didn't fly the for almost the first year and he hasn't flown in a year almost. Actually, it's yeah. been over a year he hasn't flown and he's already, he's flown at least 70 times. Yeah. So, I mean, and he's been to, I don't know how many countries, at least five countries. But yeah. my point is, I think they will remember because you'll show videos of them and yeah. that, that will help them. And, yeah. um, and you'll and be I, surprised what your kids do remember. My, we, so I was teaching in China in 2013. So my youngest was two. And he still can remember random things from China back then. I'm like, and it's funny thing is he doesn't remember much because he got his hand smashed in the hinge of a metal door. So we had to end up, we ended up going to three hospitals in Beijing. It was insane. He doesn't remember any of that, but he remembers like, oh yeah, I didn't like the food very much, but wow. I remember eating a lot of rice and and the outsides of buns. I'm like, okay, you know, and so it's amazing. You're like, how do you remember that from two years old? But I think what's what's really cool is your kid, like you, I mean, your 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 son's been on seventy flights, you know. So he knows how to fly. That's why I tell people, it's like, look, you don't just learn how to fly and learn how to travel. It's experience. And over time, kids learn how to do that. And for them, it's normal. It, it, sometimes I feel it's the parents that are more scared of the change with travel than the kids are, you know? And so kids do well. And I always, I always, you know, shake my head at people like, we'll get on the plane. Because my kids, my oldest, he's 13. He's been to 50 countries. My youngest is nine. He's been to 45. And, and we'll get on the plane and people look at us like, ugh kids and like people be total jerks about it and then you know, i mean our kids are fine they don't make it they watch their you know they have their nintendos and they have their phones and they watch the movies and then the people are like oh well they were really well behaved i'm like yeah they were better than you were yeah you know? it's, it's almost always the case yeah it's like yeah i mean yes you, you do have kids that get upset well yeah when you have the air you know going up and down the air the air pressure in their ears i mean yeah i can understand that and, and, and the kids that do bad, a lot of times just it's, it's LOP, lack of parenting. You know, people are like, oh, the, the flight attendants will take care of my kids. Yeah. No, they won't. Yeah. They are not babysitters. Agreed. So I'm with you 100% so far. Yeah. Um, so by the way, if your kids have been to 50 and 45 countries, how many have you been to? Uh, I've been about 70. Well, wow. and how many have you lived in? So, okay, so I was in high school, I was an exchange, well, I grew up in the U.S., and then uh, I was an exchange student in Australia and Finland in high school. I was an exchange student in Austria and Argentina uh, in college. I did my master's in Germany. I did my PhD in Portugal. I worked in Brazil. I worked in Lithuania for like, for Lithuania, I think I was there for like three and a half years. Um, th then, I, yeah, then I went to Brazil. Then I did my PhD in Portugal. So I was there for five years. And then uh, I came back to the U.S. And now I'll, I will like, be a vis visiting professor at a few universities abroad. Like this summer I taught a course, last couple summers I've taught courses for uh, uh, the VSS Universität Wien, like the Business University of, of Vienna. Uh, so, and I'll take students around, like I usually take a group of students once a year, obviously not this year, but usually I'll take a group of students um, abroad, you know, to give them some international experience for a where week. We, where we go, different places every time or? 
Yeah, usually well, we usually focus in Europe because I spend a lot of time there um, and it's easier to get students to sign up for European trips because I try to take students to South America and it, the numbers just aren't there. And so like, you know, work is like, look, you have to have a certain number of students to go. And so it's easier for me to get the students to do the European trips than like South America or Asia. Um, but so like, so, like one, sometimes we'll teach a whole course. So I'll teach a, we'll do like the four week summer course and we'll do it four weeks and we'll do like two or three different countries. Like we'll start in Austria, then we'll go to Spain and then, you know, Prague or whatever. And so the students get to see a few different countries because not every student can, has the money to spend a whole semester abroad. And so I think, you know, for some students, look, they only want to go for 10 days or they only want like maybe a month or three weeks or something like that. So we give them that opportunity. So look, if you, you can't spend that semester abroad, at least you have some kind of international experience. And so a lot of our students that go on the short-term trips with me are, are doing that. It's like, look, I, I can't take a semester off. I, you know, I'm a transfer student. Uh, everything has to fit in. Otherwise, I got to pay a whole another semester here, another year here. And so we try to fit it in. So it'll go like during summer school or during like the winter break. We'll do stuff like that. For four weeks. And are, is, is it so only for uh, University of Illinois? Yeah, so the, well, a lot of the universities do this, um, but the ones I do, it's all for University of Illinois students. Okay. Though, since I have um, been a visiting professor or visiting lecturer, whatever the title they want to give me that, we, that year is, at the University of Vienna, we actually will combine. So I'll have half the class will be Vienna students and half the class will be US students. And so it makes it kind of a really cool experience for my students because then it's not just going to class. It's not like a vacation and taking classes like, look, I'm living there because they live by where the students are. They, they get to meet the students. They have group projects with the other students. So I remember one, like a couple years ago when we did this, the, the local students like took our students and like, no, come, we have a student party. You're going to be the bartenders. Teach us how to make some American drinks. It was hilarious. That's awesome. And the students really got to have like a really intense, you know, study abroad experience. And it was really cool because someone would never have had that. And you're like, hey, I'm glad I can do this. So. Right. So I fun. guarantee you're changing people's worlds and that's incredible. So congratulations. Thanks, John. Um, how many continents have you been to? So I always say it depends how you count them, but I've been to every continent except for Antarctica. And we're okay. going to do that one because my youngest, that's his one he wants to do now. He wants to get to Antarctica. Um, so, but he's nine. So I'm going to wait a little bit longer to like get him there. Yeah. But that's, uh, that's the only one we have left. Me too. We're, we're on the same page. Um, which country do you think has the friendliest people in the world? Fret, well, just one. <laughs> There's so many. Rwanda has incredibly friendly people. I mean, I, we fell in love, we were in Rwanda last year and fell in love with it. It's insanely hospitable, friendly people. Um, Brazil, if you speak, well, it's funny, Brazils are, Brazilians are fun, but if you, I speak Portuguese. So like speaking Portuguese makes them like, oh, it's like even more crazy. Um, I think, um, Italian or Portuguese grandmas are the best. So if you're looking to take your little ones abroad, do a Portuguese Italy trip, you will have the most romantic dinners uh, with your wife because the grandmas will take your kids for you and, and teach them how to make pasta and make codfish yeah. while you eat. Oh, it was awesome. When our, our kids were really little, it's like, oh, hey, hi, hi, babe. We can have a romantic dinner while <laughs> the grandma So are you Italian too? Uh, Is your wife Portuguese, by the way? No, she's, she's half Greek. Okay. Um, but she grew up in the U.S. Uh, but my, uh, but we lived because the youngest one was born in Lisbon, so that's why we had all these experiences there, and we spent tons of time in Italy. So it's so because whenever because we went to Italy a lot when the youngest one was just born, like when he was like three months, six months, a year, a year and a half, you know. And so like it was all the time. It was just so funny. It's like oh, we literally go to a restaurant going, uh, you're, you're kind of like looking around. Where, where's where's the nonna? Where's the grandma? Where's she coming from? And you never see her. Then all of a sudden, boom, the food would come. She'd be out there. No, no, I'll take the baby. You, you guys eat. Like, well, okay. Wow. And do you speak <laughs> other languages besides Portuguese? Yeah. So Spanish and Portuguese, like the language I would feel comfortable teaching in English, Spanish, Portuguese, and, and German. Um, and then like, I feel I can do like intermediate conversation Italian. Like I can, you know, go out some beers with some friends and watch soccer and do that. And then like some basic tourist stuff like Lithuanian and French, um, you know, get the basic stuff out of there. But remarkable. A lot of languages. I used to live in Finland. That's all gone. And I used to know some Russian. That's all gone. It's really true. When you don't use it, you really do lose it when it comes to languages. That's why it's free. Like, well, speak it down. Like, okay, it takes a little time, but after, like we'll go to Spain or we'll go to actually, we usually go to Central or South America. It's like first day or two, it's coming out. Then it's like, Hey, and my wife's like, she just shakes her head. I'm like, what? She's like, you are so freaking happy to be speaking other languages. I'm like, I know it's awesome. She goes, I know. And she goes, she doesn't speak as many as I do. So she's like jealous, but like in a fun way. She's like, you're so, she's like, I'm so happy for you. But damn you. How did you learn them? 
Did you learn them in America or did you? Um, so I had like, I, you know, I had Spanish in high school and then I went to Finland when I was an exchange student. And then when I was going to college, I was dating a German girl. And so I started taking German to surprise her. And it was funny because then I went and saw her in Germany and had taken a semester of German just to be like some basic up, you can't see and, and I come and she goes, wow, you sound like a jerk. I'm like, wow. Yeah, I just learned, took a whole class. To, to, and all of her friends are like, wow, that's pretty good. But like after that, we dated for like three years. Never spoke German with her again. But I ended up in Germany doing my master's. And so I learned German through, through that. Uh, Portuguese. I went and lived in Brazil for about six months, and then I did my PhD in Portugal. So that's where that one came from. Uh, when I worked in Lithuania, like when I worked, I worked in Lithuania in the early 2000s, and you had this whole generation that was kind of like a lost generation, because you had the older ones that you know they got the house. Yeah, you know, when communism fell, they got the house, they got the apartment, they had everything, and then you had you know the younger generation that was going to grow up you know with English and and the new you know democracy and stuff like that. But then you had this kind of age group was like our age group um and and they were too old to have learned english in school but too young to have gotten the like the kind of the freebies like hey you already have an apartment and so they were kind of like look we want to really learn and so there's all this night classes and so i learned lithuanian to teach night classes and management and business to you know like 30 to 45 year old students um back in the early 2000s and mid 2000s and so that was a really cool experience and I have no idea how the heck I learned that much that much Lithuanian because that is one interesting language to say the least. But, well, but now I mean I'm lucky. I mean I can still like order a beer. I think. You know. <laughs> yeah, I like hey, that's impressive. I like beer. <laughs> there we go. I, I barely speak English, and I've traveled the world, and I know a lot of people. You know, when I would tell them I travel around the world, they say you must speak multiple languages. I'm like, I don't, and I'm like, you really don't need to, especially these days. In the old days, yeah. you did, but I mean, when people hear that you've been to 70 countries and your kids have been to 50. I mean, I think it's important to let people know that, you know, you don't necessarily have to speak another language. Obviously, it will help and yeah. to learn some some basic words. Yeah. And but. I remember when we first started making our videos, I used to make videos like 10 words you should know in Spanish, Italian, Hungarian, Czech or whatever. And just, I mean, even if it's, even if it's wrong, if, as long as you're close, people appreciate that. And they open up so much and they want to help you so much more. It's just you're like, already go speak English or something like that or, or speak German because I've heard that as well. And you're like, like, calm down. like. People will try. Like, you, it doesn't. Matter. You can always communicate with people. Like pointing, tummy, tummy. Yes, good. Smiley face. Batman happy. You know that the food was good. You know, it, it's amazing. Like just doing things like that and just being kind of like open enough to be to be okay with being made fun of exactly. and being open enough to be like, hey, you know what? I, you're gonna mess up. No one's gonna. You're never gonna sound like you're a native speaker because you're not. You know. So it's okay to to be. You know have a bad accent and miss, you know, misconjugate a verb or two because you're trying. And that means a lot, that means a lot to a lot of people. And, and you're right now. And now with English is the de facto tourist language. I mean, that's, all, I mean, people say, Oh, ugly American tourists. I'm like, no, you're saying it's ugly American tourists because they're all speaking English and they and an ugly American tourists could be any nationality. You know, just kind of like became, because that's the default tourist language. Right. Um, yeah. So how about on the flip side, which country do you think has the meanest immigration officers? The meat, actually, I'm trying to think. Maybe no one. No, I haven't really, I, honestly, I have not had any bad ones. There was one guy in uh, the UK, when I was living in Lithuania, I was flying to the UK, you know, one of those like night flights, you get like at one in the morning or something like that, you know, to like save some bucks. I, mean, I, was, I, was, I was a volunteer teacher, man, I had no money. So I fly in and I remember coming in and it's all like European Union and non-European, and it's just me and there's one guy and he is like out. Like he is so asleep. I'm like, I felt bad walking up. I'm just like standing there. I'm like, <clears throat> <clears throat> and I was. And then eventually the guy wakes up, huh? He's like, and you know, you can tell he's like looking at me. He takes my passports, slams it through the machine, rip the page, like no. the name page on it. Yeah, I'm like, it was not good. I was like, dude, you ripped the page. I mean, it makes it the passport. Yeah, well, no and, good. and here's the funny thing. Is I could the passport still worked relatively well. So you know, I flattened it down and tried to get it so it would work. And whenever I'd give it to the passport people and the the check-in office, I would tell them, "Hey, be careful because my page is ripped." They're like, "Oh, it's okay. It's the chip inside that matters. It'll be fine." I'm That's like, good. "Yeah, you know, it worked for your machines. It does." But then I was getting ready to uh, teach in China, and you know, about a year before. We, you know, our, 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 my youngest son was, he saw a, a bottle, and the bottle popped open. 
and it went into the cut, the rip in the passport, and went into the picture page. And I'm like, no, nah, no, nah, I'm not. Like, we flew to Germany, and they're like, yeah, no, no problem. That's a chip. That's all that matters. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't think this is gonna work when I get because some every country's gonna be so understanding. So I went and got a new passport uh, to get that. But I haven't really had. I mean, I've had some of them that were like. I remember one. I was going into when I was taking the train from Poland to Lithuania. This is like, excuse me, 2002, and. And, and I wasn't sure if it went through Belarus or not, because everyone said, no, that's not going through Belarus. You know, it goes through Poland. I'm like, okay, because I don't have a visa for this. And so I'm going, I'm going there to work. So I had like my stuff for like a year of work. We go on and then the border guards come on and, and I've flown to Poland before. I've been in Poland before. I've done this, but they have like different outfits at the, at, at the Poland with the waiting border. I'm like, who are these people? Like this, uh, so I was like freaking out that I was like going to get in trouble because I was in the Belarus without the, without the visa. And they're like, no, it's put. And so the, the lady started asking me all these questions. And I'm like, yeah, I'm, she's like, no, 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 nothing bad. I just want to practice my English. I'm like, oh, oh, oh thank God. <laughs> oh, thank God. But no, I, haven't, I haven't really had any bad ones. I, I've had someone, they try to like, they'll ask me questions like, what do you, like when I was doing my master's in Germany, they like, what are you just studying? I'm like, oh, economics. They're like, who's Adam Smith? Tell me the Keynesian theory of economics. You know, what is laissez faire? <laughs> I'm like, okay. But uh, no, I mean, since, since I became more mature, I do not get as many questions at the board anymore. So, <laughs> All right. Um, how about, and do you, by the way, do you prefer to travel by plane, boat, car? Plane. I, okay, so I'm not a big fan of flying, but I will always choose flying over everything else. I see. Yeah. I got you. How about, what's your favorite international airport? So, major one, I like, I like um, Sheeple. Yep. Amsterdam, I like that one. Amsterdam. Yeah, I like I like Amsterdam a lot. Um, one that's not, I mean, it's not a huge. Copenhagen's airport. I actually like Copenhagen's airport. It's beautiful. But but I don't fly through it hardly ever. Like I've I've flown right. last few times I've gone there, so I've taken students there. But but I remember when I used to live in Lithuania, we do a lot of like Air Baltic to to Copenhagen, that we'd fly out from there. But I always like that one. But it's a smaller one. I mean, it's not small, but it's like it's not like you know Amsterdam. It's got or, the hardwood or, floors. Yeah. Yeah, and the shops were nice. And, and so, you know, you could actually do some real shopping versus like, you know, airport shopping in the U.S. It's funny because like U.S. airports, it's built to eat and get, pick up a few things to shop at. European ones, it's built to shop with a few little things to eat at. You know, so it's a, it's a different vibe. <laughs> and how about what's your favorite U.S. airport? Um, I like any local airport that connects me to a hub so I do not have a long uh, security line. So I fly from Bloomington, Illinois a lot because it's just like, right by us but another kind of bigger city airport indianapolis has a nice airport and i mean it's i mean sometimes it's fat like we have tsa pre-check but i remember when my parents had tsa pre-check and i didn't i would sometimes get through the normal line faster than tsa pre-check because it was so so much quicker right. so but but the thing is that's just the check-in getting in thing when you're inside there's nothing inside so you know, I haven't been that to the new sucks. Indianapolis airport. I hear it's beautiful. I've been to the old one. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. No, it's, it's significantly better. It's significantly I, I've heard. Better. But it how makes about you feel uh, like the Walmart terminal? How about a credit card? Which credit card do you use when you travel? I use my Delta Platinum American Express card because we fly Delta all the time. So that, that's my go to. But is that the only one you use? Because American Express is not accepted everywhere. No, it's not. So I have, I have, a, visa, I have a United v Visa Chase card as well that I'll, I'll use that if we need to use that one. And do you find you have problems with American Express or no? Not as much as I used to. I was quite, I, I've been surprised. Like the last like two years, uh, I have not had hardly, I mean, I've had like, if I'm going shopping, shopping, like going to buy clothes or stuff like that, I've had no problems. When I go to restaurants, that's where I've had more of the issues. But mm -hmm. I would say like since 2017, I, I don't know what it is. I've had a lot better luck with my Amex than I did before because 15, 16, maybe early 2017, when I'd go travel, you know, I'd be like, yeah, I had the Amex, but I'm like, it's in the back of the wallet because no one's going to use it. But now it's, especially if you're like, if I'm looking at Central America, we've done a lot of Central America lately and, and, uh, and South America, it's been like, yeah, sure, no problem. I mean, I've even seen Discover in South America too. I'm like, whoa, Discover? Who knew? <laughs> yeah. Uh, how about Lounge? You have a favorite airport lounge? Um, I like when, for Heathrow, when you fly with Delta and you get the upgrade, because if you, because I have platinum with them, you get the, the lounge. So you get the Virgin lounge in, in Heathrow. Nice. And, and so I, I like that one. That one's nice. Um, what was another? Yeah, so that's, one, that's something that really, I'm like, I'd go back to that one. 
but there's other ones that are fine, but nothing that I'd write home about. So you're a Sky Team guy. Yeah. Gotcha. And I hope you'll you... still talk to me. <laughs> and do you get upgraded a lot? <laughs> yeah, I would say th- if because we always fly from a small airport, so the small airport stuff we always get the upgrade to let you know um, comfort whole plus family? whatever. Hmm? The whole family. Because well, I I have platinum. My wife, well, she's now gold because we didn't fly. We she just missed a flight last year for that, and the kids both have silver. So we all, so for those of you who don't know, if you have a family of four, you won't you won't get any upgrades because it's they only can upgrade one of the persons. So what you do is you split your ticket. So I'll take one of the kids with me, and my wife will take one of the kids with her. So we'll get upgraded, and then they'll get upgraded. Nice. So you buy so. you buy two separate tickets. No, no, we buy one ticket after you pay for it. You call up Delta and That's be like, good. hey, I need you to split the ticket. Gotcha. Because they're the ones who told us about it. I'm like, because my wife, she had platinum for a couple of years in a row, and I, I've had it for a while too. And we're like, how is it we both have platinum? The kids both have silver, yet we get no upgrades. And they're like, oh, what you need to do is split your ticket. And then, I mean, honestly, we'll call. Well, it's like split your reservation. Split yeah, they split the reservation. So it's still attached, but we get two different numbers. Gotcha. And then, then literally like we'll, Joss will make the call because she's the one who she does the call, does the split. And then I'll get the notification on my phone on, from the Delta app saying, hey, congratulations, you've been upgraded. So it's like almost instantly. Yeah. We used to, I used to do that with my wife um, when she had status, although since she just had gave birth, she didn't fly for, she hasn't flown over in a year and a half probably now. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a great tip, a really good tip. Have you ever sat next to any celebrities on the plane? Uh, the only, let's see, the only person that I was like, that was cool, I sat by them, because I've really never seen anybody famous traveling, like ever. Well, no, uh-huh. I saw Steven Tyler from Aerosmith once in Vienna. And I've seen him at LAX. And then, yeah, that's the only, like, that, but, like, actually traveling. So I was flying from Chicago to Amsterdam, and this is when I was in college, and I was dating a, a German girl at the time, and, and she was taking a, a travel agency class, and so her, her professor booked a ticket for me, and, you know, I'm like, and I paid normal price for it, and, and I get my ticket, they go, okay, here's your ticket, da, 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 and I, you know, go in, and, and I, it's like, you know, seat, like, row 14 or something like that, or, uh, so yeah, it's like row 14, 12 or 14, it was right in there, and I go in the plane, and like, oh, they're like, 14, you are that way, and I'm like, first off, I'm used to going this way when you walk in, <laughs> I'm like, okay, I'm like, oh, well, this is kind of normal seats, and I'm walking up, and then, you know, it's like 18, 17, 16, and I see the, 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 um, the curtain, and I'm like, 16, 15, I'm like, 15, curtain, 14, curtain, 15, is the, I'm like, I don't know what to do. There's a curtain here. I'm not supposed to go through that. I'm not like, oh, it was like business class. And so I'm like, and I, the guy's like, you're through there, dude. And so I like come through and it's during the holidays. So the normal, it's KLM. So the normal part of the plane is just like normal part of the plane. I walk through into the business class. They've got like, like Christmas lights going through. They've got the, like the greenery going, all kinds of stuff. I'm like, that's Whoa. awesome. And I was like 20, 21 at the time. And and I'm coming in, I got my ticket. And the lady's like, right there on me. He's like, can I help you, sir? I'm like, hi, I don't think I'm supposed to be here. But my ticket says like, aisle 14B or something. She's like, oh, you're right here. Let me take your backpack. Let me take your, like all this stuff. Would you like something? And I'm like, I, I don't know. <laughs> I, I was so lost. I sit down next to this guy and he was unearthing a city in Iraq um, at the time. And it turns out, he's like talking to me all this stuff. He's a super interesting guy. And like two months later, I'm looking at National Geographic and the dude is like the cover of National Geographic for like two months later. I'm like, he was a totally cool dude too. That was awesome. That's awesome. Cannot remember what his name was for the life of me, but it was, I mean, this is like 90. Hey, that, that's awesome. But I sort of was like, hey, I met somebody famous. <laughs> <laughs> uh, since, since I just saw you take a drink, what's your drink of choice when you're traveling in the air or on the ground? Uh, j- well, Jack and Ginger stirred with the Biscoff cookie from Delta. <laughs> believe me you stir that in there and take a bite it's a it's a game changer wow. you'll switch airlines favorite restaurant in the world favorite restaurant in the world damn i would say there's this hole in the wall cafe called pitanta in vicenza italy which is just like you go in grab some stuff we just you know bigly cut on it bigly noodles with a duck ragu sauce fantastic i mean it's just like but it's where my all my friends like kind of congregate so whenever i visit vicenza I'll be there and they, they all, you know, they're Italians, they go to work and they'll come there for their after drink or drinks. And I, you know, I never tell them I'm coming. And I'm just sitting there like, grande Mark, grande Mark. And then we just sit and drink spritz aperos for like 10 hours straight. It's awesome. Um, craziest thing you've ever eaten. 
craziest thing I've ever eaten. So there was like the oct octopus, um, like corn My dog I had in Japan, which was kind of interesting. The 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 shark in the the, the shark in uh, in Iceland isn't really that. It's overrated. Um, let's see, what is all the weird stuff? I don't know. Nothing really too bugs, weird. bugs. Well, yeah, when you're a kid, he does anyway. So, yeah. um, <laughs> you know, you had the the scorpions and stuff like that, but I not nothing too like nothing. I really feels like super crazy. Like we've I've had like ears and testicles and tongue and stuff like that. That's pretty crazy for a lot um, of people. So yeah, like but after a while, you're like, oh, that's actually good. Like I remember the first time I was in Mexico. My dad worked in Mexico when I was a kid, and so he took me down to one of the conferences before I went to go be an exchange. He's like, well, we should have some father son time. Come with me to this conference I'm working at which really he just wanted me to translate for him. <laughs> so, so I'm going down there. And so I met some people when I was down there, I'm like, Oh, come get a sandwich with us. And they're like, Oh, you should try lingua. I'm like, sure. And you tell me it's good. I'm like, this is like, it was like a, you know, sub sandwich made with tongue and it was phenomenal. And I'm like, Oh my God, this is so good. And they're like, you know what you just ate? I'm like, I don't care what it was. That was awesome. They're like, that was tongue. I'm like, really? Huh? But it was so good. I'm like, hey, you know what? You got me sold. And that, that really kind of opened my mind on the food stuff. I'm like, yeah. yeah if you don't know what it is, it usually tastes better. Yeah. Because there's sometimes when you think about it, like we've had cooey guinea pig in, in Peru a few times. And, and it tasted like a cross between like a pork chop and a greasy, um, like dark meat turkey. Yeah. And it's not bad. But then once you start thinking about what you're eating, that's what gets you. You're like, wait a minute. So yeah. you get like halfway through and then your mind goes, dude. Your kid has one of those in his kindergarten class. That's Mr. Fluffy you're eating. I'm like, dang it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, got a few more questions. Favorite hotel? Favorite hotel. Do you stay at a lot of hotels oh, or do you stay at Airbnbs? We do. Well, with the kids, we try to do re apartment rentals more just for the more space. We, have, right. we don't do hotels so much anymore, but there was one we did in Tanzania. It's on the, it's on the Great Rift. And you like, it's literally like on the cliff, infinity pool. It's like the influencer, like would ever want to take pictures there, but it's, it, the people are incredibly awesome. Like the, the, um, the guys like have to walk you back to your room because the animals can get in there. So you have to do that. I just, you know, you wake up in the morning and the window in your, your like little hut faces out over the great rift. And it's like sunrise is coming up. You're like, Oh my God, this is so gorgeous. And you're just like, you just feel like you're in some movie set. Like that was the coolest place I've ever seen. What was the name of it? Do you remember? Oh, it's a Safari Lodge uh, outside the Serengeti. I got, I'll, I send, got I'll send you the blog post and you can uh, edit it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, um, okay. How about your favorite island and beach? Well, being that I go from pasty white to beet red i'm not the biggest beach person I see. um I, I can make it about a half hour before i'm bored out of my mind um but i will say there are some really great beaches to go to um i think the prettiest beaches i've seen have been turks and caicos but they're probably the most expensive beaches i've ever seen um uh the beaches in brazil um i i, well, I live down there and i just love hitting the beach there um if you're looking at europe i think the greek like uh, outside of Hanya in, in, in Crete is really nice. Um, how about an island? Though? How about, since you don't really go to beaches, how about favorite island? I would say, well, for my family, definitely be Jamaica. Like we loved our time there. Some people get really upset because they feel like, like the, the touts are like, oh, people always ask me, like, that's how people make a living. Like if you show respect, like I always say, hey, man, I don't need anything today, but thanks to you, I wish you good luck. Like, hey, respect, you know, you fist pump on your way, they leave you alone. And people, other people just get really mad at them. They're like, we're just trying to make a living. And, and and I don't know. We just we just love Jamaica. Like that's one of the places my my oldest is like, can we go back to Jamaica? Can we go back? To, my youngest is like, I'll go back to Jamaica too. Like we're all about going that's back cool. to Jamaica. You know, I need to spend more time there. I've only been there once, and it was a long time ago, and it was for a short time. Um, all right, favorite travel movie or something to give you uh, inspiration? <laughs> favorite travel movie? Anytime you can watch like Lord of the Rings. Forget that New Zealand. Like go go go. Or uh, I think another funny one is anytime the vacation movies always get me like right, Chevy the, the road trip, the, the original vacation. And of course, Christmas vacation, but that's a different thing. But like the original vacation road trip one, yep. you have to watch that before you're going to road trip and look at each other and go, don't do that. Okay. <laughs> How about travel show? Travel show. So Joseph Rosendo, mm -hmm. travel scope on PBS. He, he's like, my wife will say this is who we emulate to be because he goes, he puts himself out there to experience the culture. He'll do the dances. He'll look silly. He doesn't care because he wants people to just explore and be open-minded. So he's the one that I love the most. Oh, that's great. You know, I'm going to have him on my show shortly. 
Well, we well, can tell him some husky bearded traveler thinks he's the awesomest. That's so. awesome. Have you met him? I've never met him. Oh, well. I, 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 I've actually never met any, like, you are the most famous travel person I've ever met. Well, that's not saying a lot, but no. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I, I've met Joseph many times. He lives in LA, so he's a great guy. Oh, cool. And his wife, Julie. Um, how about travel book? Uh, you, must, you must read a lot since you're a professor. Well, yeah. Well, the problem is my, my travel books are, where, so I have um, web analytics, marketing in the age of Google, Wow. Um, let's see, social media return on investment. I got gotcha. you. So, so my, my, so my, my reading consists of my class stuff or where I get guidebooks and I love reading the history and the culture background of the countries I'm going to go visit. So when I go there, it's amazing. Like if you understand the culture and the history, you start to see, ah, that's why they do that. You know, you go to Salamanca, like, why is there that one, um, face up there all covered in paint? I'm like, oh, that's Franco. Because this is one of the things they put this on there, you put it up there and they're throwing stuff at it. I'm like, oh, and you understand why they would do that to Franco and what happened during the Franco regime. And so like doing that prep work, I mean, I'll go and because one of our big places we go prep for our trips, we'll go to our local Barnes and Noble um, and we'll, you know, get some books in the thing and we'll just read through it. Like, hey, this is a good place. We'll get this. And, and I'll just read through the history and the culture part and then the food part. And so when we go, I just feel a little bit more. And I mean, I will read blogs, watch videos and stuff. And you're, you got to check you guys out and stuff. And, but it's just like, for me, I love the, the history stuff. Now my wife, she is the ferocious reader. We actually, we don't have a dining room. We have a library. So we put in the, the built-in covers and put all the books there. So she'll go through like three books a week. Yeah, my so wife, she can, well, she reads, my wife used to read one book a week, which I mean, I rarely read anything. Yeah. Um, but impressive. Is there one guidebook that you like to read the most? So for me, what I've done is I take different parts. I so like you. for me, when I take a guidebook with me, I usually take like, if I take a book, I'll take a Lonely Planet because of the maps, because they have the best maps out there. Rick Steves has like good local restaurants for Europe and stuff like that. But, but if you want to explore more, it's not good for exploring, but it's good for like, hey, you want to follow the path, Rick's path, you can do that. Um, I like to use the, the DK books before I go, but probably the best background books, I think the National Geographic ones, because that you read that, you're like, excuse me, I've got a really good feel what I'm going to see. It doesn't, they don't necessarily help you like knowing what sites to see, but it, for some reason I feel much more like in touch with the culture and in touch with the country we're going to go see, um, which is nice. Gotcha. So, cause we, it's one of the things, like, the only thing we really like on is like, we have our Osprey bags and our Delta airlines, you know, that, that's the, everything else. We're like, Hey, let's find, let's, let's try to take a little bit from everything. Yeah. All right. Two questions left. What's the most, oh, important, two left. Oh, no what's the most important thing travel has taught you? everybody's the same no matter where you are in the world people people are good everywhere in the world and if you're nice to people they'll be nice back to you i think that's one of the things like my kids they'll go around and they like that's one of the things they'll say they miss they miss meeting people and making new friends and stuff it sounds so corny but it's true i mean i just miss going out there and meeting people because you can sit down and, and talk to anybody you're like hey what are you doing i mean think about it, like we've all gone through this global pandemic so now for the next 50 years anybody that travels can say hey what, what were you doing in 2020 but what was your pandemic story? You have that connection. And the thing is, is people all over the world will have that connection. So you can talk to them. And, and, and that's one thing I just love about travel and how it changes. Like, look, everybody down deep, we all want to meet people. We want to go like understand things and know people and, and be friendly with them. And so for me, that's the biggest thing I've learned. You know, we have a lot of similarities and I, uh, and I really like that. Um, before I ask you the, my Last question, which is, what's your best travel tip? Where, where can people find you again? What's your website? So you go to waltersworld.com. It's Walters with an O on there. Um, or you can go to youtube.com slash waltersworld. Or if you search on YouTube, just put in a destination, put Walters World at the end. You'll see you know, my chubby face, or you'll see that little logo in the thumbnail. That's your logo right there? I thought that was a yeah. German. Well, the German thing's on there, but the logo in here is Walters World. But the thing is, it's a train, and it's just a normal guy on a train or gal because we feel that we can help anybody travel. Because you don't know, is that person rich, poor? Where are they from? Everybody takes a train. So the German logo is not – the German yeah, that's, that was another we, – we made this for uh, Oktoberfest you. a couple of years ago when, okay. when Germany won the World Cup. Um, I, I figured it was like a German football team or something. Um, soccer. But, so what's your best travel tip? My best travel tip is just go travel, go explore. And it doesn't have to be going to Rwanda. It doesn't have to be going to Italy. It can be just exploring your hometown. Just get out and go. Because when you get out and go, you, you force yourself into a new position. You see new things and it really opens your mind and opens your eyes to different things that are out there. And it gives you that, you know, kind of like 
rush of, hey, I'm seeing something new. I'm growing. So get out there and travel when you can, when it's safe, I should say. Very, very true. Uh, Mark, I really appreciate you taking the time um, today. I, uh, I put my headphones on because someone's drilling next door. So just want to make sure if anyone hears that, that's the reason why you're not hearing things. And uh, again, please subscribe to this channel podcast and uh, everyone be safe and um, happy travels when it's time to go. Yep. Thanks. See you later. See you later.